Hello, and welcome back to the slideshow. I'm Dakota Jackson. I'm a trombonist here in New Orleans, and I am devoted to cultivating an interest and appreciation of the trombone. And uh, this is our first three-person pod. So I have my co-host Ben with me, and I also have my co-host Jared with me. So we're going to try and figure that out. And uh, I guess we'll start with uh, Ben. How are you doing, man? Hey, man, I'm doing good. I'm um, excited, actually, to get to record my first uh, my first slideshow podcast over here in your office while I was visiting some family down here in Louisiana, so that's been nice. Um, I'm Benjamin Waltz. I'm a bass trombonist and a fishing guide up in uh, Arkansas, but I just am looking forward to uh, learning more and spreading some of the things that I've learned about trombone. And uh, we've also got Jared with us. How are you doing, man? I'm good. Uh, yeah, I'm Jared. I'm a trombonist based out of Utah. Uh, that's mostly all I do. I also do audio engineering and other fun things like that um, over on this side. Yeah, so uh, as Ben mentioned, me and Ben are in the same, they're in, more in my office in New Orleans. But Jared is actually still in Utah, yeah, I mean... so there is some remoteness going on. I also had to try and figure out some technical stuff, um, <laughs> but I think this is some work. I don't know. Might have some uh, more room noises than usual, but I think it will sound good. It should hypothetically sound better than normal. Um, as far as what I've been up to recently, just like gigging and stuff, I don't want to go too far on this because we've got all three of us here, but... I've been gigging and um, buying old Conrad CDs. I've been trying to collect his early stuff I bought. I just bought um, New York Hardball or Hardball, something like that. Yeah, New York Hardball is the name of it, which is a second one, a second album I bought with Every Breath before that. Um, and uh, I've been trying to get on top of the slideshow thing too, because uh, we've been getting a lot of good feedback recently, like um, some random people hitting us up and that's really cool. Um, but uh, how's your how's your week been going, Jerry? It's been good. Uh, just did a gig yesterday. That was a fun little. Now that it's December, all the Christmas gigs are starting to come through. Well, November was pretty, uh, pretty chill. Mostly just working on things and practicing. So it's been a good week. Uh, got got some fun things coming up. How about you, Ben? What's been going on, man? Uh, just recently getting back into the trombone after taking a pretty long break uh my last week trip had some hiccups and just had to figure out uh moving back to Arkansas I had to figure out some things and was able to join up in a community orchestra and so get got back on the bass trombone we had a little concert there and uh looking to do some more trombone work uh brass band stuff things like that in the spring so that yeah so um you guys are going to be hearing this January 1st. We're not recruiting this on the first time. What is the day? It's the 4th of December. And um, that's because we're switching over to a season format. So after we drop, we'll be dropping a bunch in a row, and then we'll take a little break and drop a bunch more in a row. Um, and I think that format will help us uh, in, a, in a number of ways, but I, I hope you guys like that. You know, give us feedback and what you guys think about that. Um, it should be it should be interesting, and I think it'll we're we're going to record them in advance, so it'll give us a lot of organizational stuff in our direction. Um, also, I want to kind of use this time. We usually kind of do these corny beer announcements or whatever, like what we were drinking. I want to do this time to uh, plug the Patreon again. While I said we're going to the season format with the recordings, as far as the uh, Patreon, that won't be done that way. They'll be monthly content uploaded to patreon we already have quite a bit up there we have um playlists for every episode that we've got out and uh, separate from the episode itself like a playlist curated based on what was in the episode and then we've got like some uh, videos that we're toying with if you guys want to see our face <laughs> and see what we look like instead of just hearing our voice so that's kind of interesting us right now we're toying with slideshow deep dives but there's a uh, the name is pending um and that's a little bit different of a format. We just kind of start off uh, just talking about some random trombone thing. And then last time we did it, we ended up talking about Charlie Vernon's suit. So you never know where it's going to go. It's definitely not like this where it's 
super researched out, but I think it is kind of cool if you're looking to get into the trombone corner of things. Um, and we already have one Patreon, which is awesome. Uh, it's my, I'm just going to go ahead and shout it out. It's my guy, John Rising. I'm a big fan. He um, runs the trombone choir here in New Orleans and uh, just does a lot for the trombone. He's a good trombone player and uh, I'm a really big fan of him as a person. Um, so our topic this week, getting into things, is uh, Oral Williams. Um, we're going to keep going with our shifting between um, like instruments and players. And we really enjoyed the old episode talking about that factory. So this one was kind of a no brainer and uh, I really enjoyed digging into this. Um, learned a lot of cool nuggets I didn't know. I've always kind of known Earl Williams had its own little mystique, uh, but I kind of understood why more as we kind of got into that. Uh, Earl Williams was actually born in uh, 1890. I was looking into that too. And it's it's really interesting because on his draft card, it says 1890, but then on his tombstone, it says 1889. Oh, so like there's, there's almost like a weird, like, well, there's maybe a year somewhere in there. Like, all we know is like 1890 is at least a good benchmark. <laughs> That's nice. That was cool. That's just like an undecided age. But I also, that could be wrong too. I haven't actually seen the tombstone. That's just what someone's <laughs> reporting online. He was from Ohio, a town called Gibsonburg. And uh, Williams was in Toledo in 1900, which is about uh, 30 miles from Gibsonburg. So uh, he kind of moved to Toledo right after that. Uh, but the big move for him early on that like kind of sets him up as an instrument maker is in 1910, his family moved to Elkhart, Indiana, which as you guys know, is like a super huge place in terms of like trombone production and instrument manufacturing for that matter. Um, and like, I think uh, a lot of this information I got from Rob Stewart, if you guys haven't go check out his accounts and stuff like his website has a lot of really good history stuff. We also leaned on him pretty hard for the old thing. He had some incredible information on that. Uh, and I think it's a pretty cool uh, little museum thing where you can just look at horns and stuff. I, I'm just, yeah, plugging Rob Stewart. Go check go ro check Rob Stewart out. Uh, whenever we do these and I like use someone quite a bit, I always try to like plug them and certainly that's the case here with Rob. But when he moved to Elkhart, Indiana at 20, according to the census, he was listed as a mechanist, help, uh, mechanist helper and his daughter said that this was probably for Khan. Elkhart is currently home to Khan, Selmer, and King. Um, King is originally from Cleveland. That's why the earliest Kings are Cleveland Kings or whatever. So uh, I don't really know how this lines up time-wise. I'm pretty sure that Selmer wasn't there yet. Obviously, Selmer is uh, like a French company. So like Paris, I think, was like a original location for them. If any of this is incorrect, I didn't dig deep into um, the... Uh, specifics of like Selmer and uh, King I just know that like they're located there now it's like a conglomerate but uh Khan was there at this time so that kind of adds up uh I also like every time we do this I always like to throw out the distinction because I know this confused me a lot early on was that Elkhart Indiana and Elkhorn Wisconsin are different places <laughs> and uh Elkhorn Wisconsin is where like Getson is and Edwards so uh that can that can be confusing that they both have elk names but like the earliest that we know he was working with uh, after the con thing that we know he was working with a builder was he worked with Olds in Los Angeles. Old, like uh, Frank had originally worked for a con in like the early 1880s as well. So, um, so yeah, like we know that he started working with Frank pretty early on, which is kind of interesting that we bridged between Olds and, uh, and Earl for our next episode. I mean, it's, it's not um, not a complete coincidence because they're both in California and everything uh, later on. But uh, but yeah, we do know that he worked uh, with Frank. And then we know he was working with uh, Frank in 1917 when he registered for the draft. And we know he was married um, and had a four-year-old daughter at that time. And then the next record we have of him uh, was 1920 and he was single again. So yeah. uh, it was like uh room and board in a boarding house and uh he was just like a he was employed as a band repairman at this time so i guess somewhere between there uh you know he was in the war and he got divorced um which <laughs> is dark and gloomy but kind of all we get on the period you don't know if he was he might have been widowed 
Yeah, that's. I guess that's true. That could have happened. Uh, his wife could have passed away. I mean, that's also really if, dark. But I don't know if divorce was as common back then, and I feel like uh, life expectancy was also lower back then. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's true. Um, uh, but we do know that he left Olds around the state. Um, but before that, he was only living like 12 blocks from the factory, which I think is kind of interesting because we'll talk about later. That's like a theme where he liked to live close to where he worked. But we don't know if he came back to work for Olds after the deployment or not. Um, the next thing we have is that in 1928, he, uh, he got his first patent for his tuning mechanism. Yes, yeah, so I was looking at this tuning, tuning mechanism. And a lot of people talk about it being like this old specific one. And yeah, it has few differences from uh, from the old and con mechanism, but it's pretty much the same, the uh, same tuning and slide mechanism that you see on old and con. So there's really not, there's not much to that. Uh, I believe there's some examples of Williams trombones with tuning in the bell, but for the most part, the tuning on the slide thing at this, this point in time was a, uh, be normal. He also had a. Uh, he also had another patent not too long after for a uh, cur for the uh, curved hand slide that you'll see on almost all Williams promotes after this. Yeah, I think that patent was in 1930, which was uh, two years later. Um, but you can actually find horns with a uh, patent pending stamp on it. There's a bunch of little stuff like that. Uh, we'll talk about this later with the uh, Nelson stuff. We'll get into a little bit. But there's a bunch of little stuff like that that you can use to date Williams, too, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but in 1928, he started making Williams and Wallace uh, horns. Like, it was his partnership with J.K. Spike Wallace, who was in the L.A. film. And uh, J.K. stood for John Kipper Wallace. Um, and I think Ben kind of has more information on uh, Spike than I do. So if you want to talk about Spike for a second, man? Yeah, so Spike was a trim bonus. And he also seemed, seemed to be that he uh, he really ran the uh, Wallace Trump or the Williams and Wallace uh, partnership. Uh, Spike was definitely more on the business side of things. Uh, he was he was the bass trombonist for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, but before that, he was principal trombonist of the uh, the uh, not so long lived Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra. Um, so I was actually looking into Spike's time in the orchestra, and I did find an example of one of the uh, trombones he played. And during the time period, during the time period that he actually was switching to a bass trombone, uh, found a an old bass trombone that was made specifically for Spike in Los Angeles. And what I, what I found interesting about this is the fact that uh, the timing really works out that it could have been actually made by Earl Williams, and this could have been how they started their relationship. So it could be the earliest example of these two collaborating, which was 1919 which was a good bit before the actual partnership ever showed up. And once again, this he was playing an old trombone, but it seems like Spike uh, must have at least known about Earl Williams by this point. So they were at least working together to some extent 10 years earlier than the partnership was. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Like the, the official you know, like um, like partnering would be in 28, but it's definitely possible. 1920 was when he was like a repairman. So that's, I think that could have lined up. Um, and we don't really know when he left Olds either. So I think there's kind of a wish-washy period here where he like, I mean, he wouldn't have been not able to build horns at this period, but like, I'm not sure if he was building them or not. Um, and he could have went to Olds and like Earl was working there. And uh, there's a number of things that could have happened. Uh, the only other thing I know about Spike was that he was the uh, president of the Musicians Union in Los Angeles. I actually found that out from his uh, uh, what what is it called when you when you die and it's in the newspaper? Uh, obituary. Obituary. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> I found that in his obituary. He was uh, he was seventy one. Um, and then uh, as far as other employees, the only other big one that kind of came to mind was this guy Cliff. And I I actually kind of had trouble finding information on Cliff. Maybe. People know more than I do, but um, he made worked with Earl and made about 500 trombones and one trumpet. I don't know why the one trumpet is listed like that, but um, he actually got deported um, around 1930 back to England. So, um, but I don't really know a ton about this guy. Um, we do know that, like right after his departure, 
um, is when uh, Earl started like changing the stamps on the horns a little bit. So I, it probably was significant to him. Yeah. So you you were talking about the cl the cliff signed horns. Uh, I believe the re the reasoning behind the uh, one trumpet thing was because uh, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like they made very many trumpets. And with most of these trombones back in the day, you will find examples, especially of the Williams and Wallace horns, at least being signed by the people who engraved them. You'll uh, we uh, notice that Cliff uh, he was signing them all the way up until he was uh, until he was deported in the 1930s. And so I, I thought that was pretty neat. I was glad you pointed that out. Yeah. So Cliff, the reason I the reason a lot of us uh, the reason we focus in on Cliff here though is because that at the time at least we're not seeing a lot of different employees employees over the shop. So it really does seem like he keeps it a pretty small shop. And uh, based on some other interviews later on, it doesn't seem like the shop really grows in size, in size that much, uh, just based on some, just based on some uh, interviews, especially one with uh, John Knox, and it doesn't seem like he's, the shop ever really got too big, uh, most, just a few people. Yeah, I think um, one of the, one of the reasons for that, too, is that, um, there was like some family stuff with him, which kind of dictated stuff. In 1937, his mother-in-law passed away. Uh, so he moved in with his father-in-law. And uh, I think in that period, he moved into like a shed-ish situation, just a smaller shop for sure. Um, and during this period, he definitely scaled down into building like a smaller number of uh, trombones and trumpets and even made some uh, hand slides for Selmer's triple threat, which I looked into a little bit. Um, the Somer Triple Threat was a, a 490 bore with a seven and a half inch yellow bell. Um, it's pretty interesting when I looked these horns up. I am um, personally am not super familiar with early Somer horns. I know that there's kind of a uh, weird history in terms of um, Somer like making quality brass instruments and then kind of redirecting into the woodwinds as their primary thing. And then uh, so I don't know a ton about when all that happened. Um, but when you find these horns, I think they're a little rare. Um, when you find them, they actually had, uh, most of the ones that I have seen have two different slides. They have the Earl Williams slide and then the, uh, I guess, a regular slide that Selmer was making. You can tell the difference because the Earl Williams has the Earl Williams brace on the hand. Um, kind of a neat looking trombone if you've never seen one. It has like a S. It's got some nice engraving. A lot of old horns do it. It's one of my favorite things with old horns. But um it's got like a big S as the counterweight in the back, if you never check that out. Um, but yeah, he was working with them, so that was giving him some work. And then also during this period is when he starts uh, refining his models four, six, and eight, which are his primary models outside of uh, bass trombone stuff, which we'll get into. But in 1942, he started working as a contractor for Boeing, and uh, that created a lot of financial success for him. So I think that helped uh, catapult him out. And in 48, he got his patent for a water key uh, that used from that period. Water key, it just means spit out. I always like when I'm researching the word water key comes up and I always have like a pause, but I just call it a spit valve. And if you're too fancy to say spit valve, then uh, water key works, I guess. Um, I, I definitely am not. But uh, but yeah, he used the, the spit valve from then on. What, uh, what was going on? So it was kind of curved, wasn't it, Ben? Yeah, so the, that was the big thing was the uh, with his uh, patent. And I guess the reason he was probably allowed, allowed to patent it was the fact that the water key just was more ergonomical, kind of hugged the slide a little bit better. It was... Which was, de which was definitely like a, a thing with him. I mean, the hand slide and everything, he definitely was thinking a lot about, I guess, comfort in terms of playing. I know that this was kind of an issue later on for uh, Denilson. We'll get into that. I know one thing about the water key um uh, later when he was ended up uh kind of getting taken in the hands of jay armstrong they were like oh yeah we don't like this water key so they ended up just changing it more to like what you would see standard on the water key because they were saying it was unergonomic which i thought was interesting because one of the main things they talk about with like the early earl williams ones is how great the water <laughs> uh water key is <laughs> but they ended up changing it later like 70s yeah, I think um, 
I I think when we were talking about um, when we had our slides episode a while back, I was talking with uh, with Ben, and I think one of the conclusions we came to is you can't make a great spit valve, but you can make a bad spit valve. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 one of these things that you don't notice hopefully yeah. ever and if you do it's not usually because you think boy that's a great spit valve so yeah I, I think in general we're kind of fans of the simple the simpler the better but um before i'll get into the horns here later but around this time he starts making the model 10 and he starts uh, adding uh, f attachments to the six and eight which respectively made the model sevens and nines um, and in 58, the Williams family moved uh, to a fairly large property on the corner of Burbank Boulevard and uh, Mariposa Street. Um, and there was a shop that he built, which was facing Mariposa. And that's where William did the, his business from then on. And this is kind of a big distinction if you're into collecting these horns. Um, I specifically <laughs> watched a video with Ben earlier where somebody was talking about how the Burbank horns are like, are really good. I won't, I won't use the terminology he used just because I think it's a bit ridiculous. Yeah. But the um, but the if you're looking for these horns, it's definitely a thing. Is looking for Burbank versus uh, Los Angeles, which is um interesting because that was the thing with Olds too. Um, they have Los Angeles and what what was the other um is somewhere else in California? I mean, obviously later they there's some weird Texas stuff going on, and that was all kind of bad. Um, but yeah, definitely shop location is something to look for in older horns. Um, around 1958, he started making uh, arrows out of aluminum, which is interesting because this kind of ties into, I, I don't know how much I want to get into this, um, but it kind of ties into this fascination he had with, uh, there's a couple things that he had a lot of engravings on early on, and it was like nature scenes, uh, Native Americans, and uh, dogs, and uh with the Native American thing, he had, seems to have a fascin fascination with arrows. Obviously, he was making arrows out of aluminum at this point. I don't know for recreational use or what. I don't think he was selling them. Um, but you can find some old uh, Earl Williams trombones that have like a little arrowhead in the back. And then there's Native Americans on some of them. Uh, it's interesting when his uh, they were interviewing his daughter about some of these engravings. He had a lot of dogs on some of them. And she didn't really know of any kind of fascination he had with dogs. It wasn't like he owned dogs, I guess. I mean, he did own dogs, but it wasn't like he had some kind of hyper fixation with them. So the engraving stuff I find kind of interesting because usually it's like flowery stuff or something, but it seems like Earl a lot of times would go for pictures of stuff. And uh, those pictures are somewhat random, it would seem. Yeah, I believe the American West really caught his mind because you do see scenes with bison a lot of the times or you see native americans or any types of designs like that uh it does seem like he seems uh, fixated a little bit on the american west or at least the uh especially like the williams and wallace horns you see a lot more of that and then uh as for the arrows from what i was seeing at least it, it looked like that was actually a big part of his a big part of his hobby uh he was into he was in archery and shooting uh, he actually, uh, on top of making his own arrows, he designed a drill for gun barrels. He actually has a patent for it in 1964. I was going to say something similar to that. I'm just assuming, I'm not much of a hunter, but I'm assuming he's just a big-time hunter, and that goes well with dogs, arrows, you know, just <laughs> love for, like, outdoorsy stuff, which makes sense for all of those interests. Yeah, for for sure. Um yeah, I think the I think the overarching conclusion here is that the engravings on the Earl Williams are some kind of glimpse into his personality um, or kind of his character, and uh, I don't know, maybe even Cliff's character before he got deported. I don't know. Let's mm -hmm. to look into it too. I kind of wish we knew more about Cliff, but you know, it is what it is. Um, so, so Williams ended up dying in 1971. The gun barrel thing, I think, is the the drill for the gun barrels in '64 was kind of the last thing that I found before that. Um, and then when he died in '71, his son Bob uh, continued making a small number of trombones after his death. Um, I don't really have a ton of information on Bob, and the shop closed in '77. So this only happened for six years. And I would be interested if there's some kind of significance to those horns, but um, there was a post Earl uh within the same shop that horns were made and then after his death 
uh, things start getting a little bit crazy in terms of what happens. Um, so all of this machinery was for sale, uh, but it was apparently really expensive. And in the early 80s, Larry Minnick had plans to expand the trombone, uh, making activities. So he took a lot, uh, he took at what he took a look at what was there and he determined that the asking price was too high for the antique machinery and the mandrels that uh, had become rusty. And then later, Zig Constell and Chuck Levine looked it over, which so uh, we talked about Constell with the old factory stuff because he worked at Olds. We might even do an episode on Constell in the future. I definitely thought um, there was a bunch of cool stuff going on there. I think people, I think they're going to see our California bias. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If we go, if we go Constell um, next, we're gonna, they're going to well, see we're not, I don't think we'll do him next, but if we're looking for makers down the road, um, in fact, you know what? I'll, I'm laying down the law. We're not, whoever we do next, is not going to be in California. Maybe we'll do, maybe we'll do my bias and we'll do Getson and I'll just fanboy for a whole episode. But uh, yeah, we'll, I promise no more, no more California in the next episode, but somewhere down the road, probably. Um, but Zig and Chuck kind of saw promise in the, the dormant company that they had purchased the, they, they purchased like a 30 day option to buy for a buck, which I think is kind of interesting. Like, uh, I guess they paid a dollar to like, have the option to purchase everything and look everything over. But at this point, Constell was only like he was in the formation stages of his own business and they couldn't uh, get larger makers interested in the venture, so they let it go. Um, but eventually the business was purchased by Mary and Jay Armstrong. And this is kind of an interesting period. I know uh, Jerry was talking about this with the uh, spit valves. Um, who they, produ they produced these uh, trombones in Nelson, Tennessee for some years. Um, and then they sold to Colicchio. But I want to do, I do want to take a second and talk about these the Nelson horns. Um, I found quite a bit of stuff. I know that, um, so yeah, David Brubeck uh, has a pretty good piece on this to Nelson period. Um, and also it's like, you should go check out the, it's an interview with Jay Armstrong. You should go check it out because there's quite a bit of stuff in here about the making of the trombones in this period. And also just kind of some interesting thoughts on Earl Williams. Um, which I'll kind of get to in a second. I guess I'll do that post this history, but like kind of what makes them unique and why they're sought out and just some personal thoughts of mine. Um, nothing, nothing too crazy. But um, so in Denilson, Tennessee, they were they were forming the horns. And I know that uh, there was kind of some weird stuff going on. One of the ways you can date these is they were moving between if you look at the bells of an Earl Williams, there's like three lines of text which say like Earl Williams and then the model and then like the Nelson, Tennessee, and then um, they move between three and four lines of text. And you can kind of use that to date them out. Um, it's kind of hard to narrow down what happened. Actually, in the interview, I think Jay Armstrong says that he doesn't know the exact year, but um, it's certainly an option for trying to figure that out. And I know that during this period, there was some, uh, there was some, interesting some good stuff going on as far as they weren't making everything into Nelson. They were having certain stuff sent to them. Um, maybe some Frankenbone stuff. Uh, do you know what's going on with that, Ben? Yeah, so I didn't see necessarily everything from the Nelson era, uh, Frankenbone, when I was looking at Frankenbones, but I think Williams actually has quite the history of it. Uh, you see a lot of horns are mated with either ton outer slides for some reason. Um, also, I was seeing one instrument that had a uh, had a Williams bell with a Shoki valve section, double valve section put into it. Um, and then I actually, then I saw a, another example of Williams being married to a con. So I'm seeing a lot of that, but I didn't see specifically from the Nelson era. Yeah. Pretty... Um, there's certainly something to look into is like the Nelson area. The Nelson era trombones, I think they're kind of like trying to be as close to the old trombones as they could and like maybe making adjustments where they were. I know that that during that period, Jay Armstrong was kind of another period where I guess Jerry was talking about where they had a lot of issues with uh, the spin belt. Just getting a hold of it too was also, I guess, a pain for them, um, getting parts and stuff. But eventually De Nelson had some issues. So they sold back to Colicchio, who I kind of know as a trumpet maker. Um, maybe that's just my own weird preference, but uh, who, who was back in Los Angeles, um, and more trombones were made there. But there just wasn't enough time or space devoted to them. Uh, so Caligula eventually sold the Williams Company to Richard uh, Krovner in Riverside, California, who planned to produce the trombones but didn't have the resources. So I guess during this period, like, 
he had all the stuff but didn't do anything with them. And then after Colicchio moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, they bought back the company and reestablished the production of trombones. So it's kind of interesting. There's two different Colicchio period, or sorry, Colicchio periods here. Um, the main force behind Colicchio during these uh, later periods is John Duda, who is the son of Benja's foreman Lou Duda. And after attempting to have some of the trombones build uh, building contracted out to other shops, they continue to be logistic problems that prevent a lot of success. Um, so the economic recession that made matters worse, and then they look to sell it again. And after several years of uh, sharing shop quarters with uh, Mercewitz, I think that's how you said it. I always struggle with that one. Can be Oregon, uh, Duda, uh, and Duda moved to Kansas City, Missouri, uh, in the same shop as Mike Oregon. And then Mike's had all their stuff since then, which um, I know that when we looked at the uh, when Mike Oregon's factory, I've been up there a couple times, particularly when I went to pick up my BSD. And uh, it was pretty cool to see some of the old uh, Williams mandrels up there. So I know he's like got a big uh, collection of that stuff. And also he has like a showroom where he has a number of uh, Williams trombones. So on the subject of John Duda, I just think it's interesting. Um, I was actually reading this interview with uh, John Knoxon, who used to work for the Earl Williams, used to work for the uh, Earl Williams company. And he actually said that uh, he likes the Duda horns more than the instruments that he made with the company back in the Burbank days. He actually said he he said that they're uh, everything the old ones were. And so he actually likes the current. What were the current ones? This was in 2015. But he actually said personally he liked the uh, the newer ones, which I thought was interesting because you always hear everybody pining for the old days. <laughs> that is. Uh... That is interesting. I um, I think that kind of recaps the history. I mean, I, that was kind of a lot really fast, um, but that kind of caps what we know. And uh, I just wanted to kind of pull some general observations. We'll kind of go around the room here and uh, kind of think about it. But like for me, one thing I kind of noticed while doing this was that um, I always kind of thought of, I knew they were harder to find, Williams in general, but I always kind of thought of them as similar to like someone like Olds, but I don't really think that's the case. Like Olds was very much a factory that produced a lot of trombone, especially later, you know, because they got into the beginner trombone realm, uh, with stuff like the Ambassador. But uh, Williams was always kind of like a horn to horn shop or like a small operation. And I kind of find that interesting. And we'll talk about, Actually, you know, I, I will I'll will wait to the second half here on the segment to talk about playing them and what the horns feel like. But I do think they're a little bit rare. And I think that, like, one of the things we've realized is that there's a lot of uniqueness to these horns individually if you buy them. I even found, and we'll talk about this, that some of the bell sizes from the same models were slightly different. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff as far as uh, trombone to trombone, almost like they were a custom shop. And... One of the things I saw was someone saying that, you know, Mike Corgan was making Williams trombones, which he's not doing. He's making BAC trombones, but he is using their mandrels and stuff. And so I think it kind of continues the spirit of making trombones per person or whatever. Uh, well, what's what kind of is your uh, takeaways from the from the uh, from the research on the history, uh, Jared? I was going to say the same thing. It feels like it's very personal. Like as a seller, he knows who he's selling to, and be like. If he was still alive and like brought him a Trump bone, he'd be like, Oh yeah, I remember selling this one to so and so, like when they, you know, ordered it through me. I think that's I mean, that's like especially unique, especially considering I I don't know, it's hard to imagine like that small of a production uh going on, but also creating, you know, uh such reputable horns and also the names playing on them, you know, having such uh big names also playing on these horns it's kind of hard to imagine it being such a small production yeah i um it's funny you mentioned the uh the bringing a horn back to him because i kind of think about it. i recently ran into uh mike corrigan at itf when i went back this last time and listened to christian Lindbergh and all that it was incredible but um i ran into him when we were talking about my horn and uh he i was talking to my come up there and he was like oh, i don't really remember which makes sense here he sees tons of people and he's like you know but if you pull out the horn i probably remember it 
and I pulled out the horn and he was like, he remembered everything about it. I mean, he spent a lot more time building the horn than meeting with me, but yeah. <laughs> um, it was, it was pretty cool. He was like, yeah, you know, like that's a lot, that's kind of rare because we didn't make a lot of those. And I know this horn is like nice. a one of a kind, so that's pretty cool. But yeah, it's, start, it's definitely a thing. Uh, ben, what was, what was your takeaways, man? So yeah, the, one of the biggest things I, uh, one of the biggest things I drew from this, especially, uh, you know, especially looking into the, the earlier days was uh, I didn't realize how many things the Olds company had their hands in, in starting in that area. I didn't realize, I mean, I knew that, you know, a lot of the uh, boutique California shops, when I think Consto, I think Williams, places like that, I just didn't realize that Olds was such a key figure in all of this. And so I guess I didn't realize, yeah. I'm glad we did the Olds episode first, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely think it's cool that um, I think part of the reason, you know, he, Ben was talking about our California bias or something, which is pretty fine. I, just so we're clear, n- neither me or Ben has any connection to California. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I do think it's interesting that there is kind of this, like, I feel like anyway, it's kind of this mystic allure to these uh, these California horns. Like there was this period where there was a lot of like high-end horns coming out of California out of these makers who were all kind of connected because like we were talking about Constell and he got his start kind of working with olds and stuff like all of these guys knew each other and worked together and like you know even if they didn't work together they probably definitely knew of each other and um we're all out here making horns and stuff and now now that's not really a thing in California there's not a lot of big trombone makers in that area anymore um and I think there's a number of reasons for that but so now that they're harder to get, I think there's this cool mystique to them, and they definitely did make high-end horns, um, which are something to check out. But uh, I think we're going to take a uh, a little break here, and then when we come back, we'll talk about specifically the different models and uh, some people who played them and just some cool nuggets about the horns themselves. All right, y'all. Welcome back to the slideshow. So, uh, like I said, in the first half, we kind of covered the history and got into that a little bit. And um, the second half, I want to go into horns. And uh, I think the best way to do this would kind of be uh, start at the top and work our way down to Ben. <laughs> um, and then kind of Jared has some cool nuggets too, but some other stuff. But um, so he... Um, Whenever Earl was making horns, so like he released them in even numbers. I didn't really understand how I still like as a guy who's been um like adjacent to Earl Williams or whatever, like I knew about them, but I don't really messed with them any. I just kind of knew about the six, like as a really common one. And I didn't really know how that worked. I didn't know if he went one, two, three, four, five, and then got up there or <laughs> but it seems like uh he was working in even numbers, and we'll kind of talk about that in a second too. Um, but he was the four, the six, and uh the eight were his like original models that he refined. And the four was a 490 bore. The six was a 500 bore. This was the most popular option. Um, and the one that I think today people still seek out the most. And the eight was a 522 bore. Now later he came out with the model seven and the model nine, but the model seven is the same as the model six. So it's a 500 bore, but it has an F attachment. And the Model 9 is the same as the 8, but with an F attachment. Um, and I kind of ran into some interesting stuff. I was looking at a uh, a Model 6, specifically serial number 19402. Um, it was 500 bore size with a 7.5 inch bell. But I did find people claiming to have like 8 inch bells and even 7 and a quarter bells. And I, um, after some research with this, at first, I was thinking that like maybe people were mismeasuring their bells or something, but I think a uh, firmer conclusion after kind of looking at a lot of stuff is that um, these horns, because we were talking about them being like released person to person, might have been slightly different, like almost custom. Like I don't think, or he was trying to figure out what the Model 6 was and stuff. So I think seven and a half is a good stepping stone, although I think a lot of them are come off as eights, um, eight inch bells. And I'd be interested if you have one 
kind of your thoughts on that. If you're listening to this part and you know more than I do, please uh, send me some info on this because I was kind of finding some weird stuff uh, as far as bell sizes. Um, but th that was with, like the three main ones, the four, six, and the eight. And like I said, the seven and the nine uh, went up a little bit. And then I'm going to let Ben kind of handle the 10 and maybe even talk about the, the nine a little bit working his way back. Okay, so yeah, um, the model the model ten was released right around the same time as the seven and nine, where it was it was uh, Earl's Earl's shot at uh, putting a any valve trombone, uh, but uh, a valve trombone, a trombone with a uh, attachment on it. But the model ten was the base trombone. It was at five sixty five bore. Um, also, it had a nine and a half inch bell. Though I believe I've seen some examples of nine and ten inch. 10 inch horns too. I believe some of those might, might have been made on a custom basis. But uh actually had a really cool nugget about the uh 10. Uh it was actually during this uh interview that I was reading, I uh, was talking about how the Williams Model 10 was actually the horn that Bob Olson grabbed whenever he went to go play for the Stan Kenton band. He was playing the third book, but he didn't know it. He thought he was playing the bass trombone book. So he ran to the store and bought a bass trombone because I guess that's what people did back then. <laughs> when, they, when they had a gig, they ran to the store if they didn't have that instrument. He ran, got a bass trombone, showed up to the kitten band and uh, realized that there was already another bass trombone there. And uh, yeah, Stan Kitten ended up liking having two bass trombones in his group after they played and Rest is history. Now the Stan Kent band has five trombones, two of them being bass trombones. So I thought that's pretty cool to know that the uh, that the uh, um, Williams Model Ten was uh, involved in that little tidbit of history. Yeah, that is interesting. Also, um, kind of working back a little bit history on that. Um, Bert Van Leer was the original "quote unquote" bass trombonist of the uh, Stan Kent Orchestra. And we know for a fact that when Burt Van Leer played the bass trombone for Stan Kenton the first time, it was not a bass trombone at all. It was a just like a symphonic horn with an F attachment, and uh, Kenton thought it was a bass trombone. And so, like, the first bass trombone wasn't actually a bass trombone. Um, also, <laughs> not to get off on a weird tangent here, but um, I recently was on trombone chat. I guess this is the kind of stuff if you're listening to the pod, you'd be interested in. Recently got on trombone chat because I was on Reddit and I saw this kid asking about what a bass trombone was or better yet, kind of like what he should buy a concert horn or a bass trombone like going forward. And it got me thinking about what a bass trombone was um, and how to like just properly define that. So I put on trombone chat, my question was, what is a bass trombone? And I felt a little silly doing it. I thought maybe people would like uh, really come at me for asking what a bass trombone was. But uh, there's been like 32 replies. So it turns out that what a bass trombone is is actually not a simple answer at all. And I think that uh, some of these responses tie into this Burt Van Leer thing, which is that he was playing the largest trombone in the group and playing the part. Um, and you can, I don't know, that might trigger some people out there. I'm not sure. I'm not trying to, sure. yeah, no pun intended. I'm not trying to, um, you know, if you think a bass trombone is like whatever, I'm not arguing with you, but I do think that um, there's something to be said about playing just larger trombones um, and those equating to eventually being bass trombone or leading to what would eventually be played uh, in the group. Um, Some more bass trombone, bass trombone olds. Uh, or old, but some bass Ramon uh, Williams models that I was seeing, not necessarily Model 10, because there really wasn't uh, any of their basic production models besides the Model 10 that were bass Ramones. But we did see Williams Bells used consistently in other places. Uh, I was looking at an old ITA journal, for example, talking about the invention of the double trigger bass Ramon. And there was an example that uh, Shoki made, the Shoki company made, of a very early independent bass trombone that had a Williams bell attached to a Shoki valve section. Uh, so you could you would sometimes see things like that. You would see people mixing and matching, mixing and matching their bells and hand slides. Uh, 
I know there's a few examples of like con 70 H is being matched up to model tens, which that does kind of make sense that 70 H is a very similar size instrument, single trigger bass trombone in that 567, 565 bore, or 560, 562, 565 bore range. So uh, maybe some people might have wanted the slightly smaller, smaller board, not by much, 70 H slide, but you'll see those pop up. But you really don't see uh, very many of those double trigger horns on the Williams because by the time the Williams uh, company had uh, mostly disappeared, by the time it, uh, it just wasn't what it is anymore, um, the double trigger bass drum just really wasn't that popular by that point. So that's why mostly when you see the Model 10, you're seeing just single trigger bass drum as they were. Yeah, I think um, kind of something interesting with the Model 10, which is a uh, was 565. I don't know if we do we talk about the board size already. Yeah, it's slightly large, slightly larger than your standard like 562 is kind of the norm, but it doesn't make much of a difference. Yeah, I always find that stuff kind of interesting when it's like slightly other norm. Um, I was I saw a thread on Trauma and chat looking around, and someone had uh, serial number 1145 and serial number 1146, and there was a pretty radical amount of just like little details and then the bell size was about a quarter of an inch different um between those two trombones so like that's what i'm saying with like sort of like the uniqueness of the horns but also just like from horn to horn um and once again like if you are a williams owner i would be interested what your experience with this is um but yeah i'm gonna let uh I'm gonna let Jared take over real fast and kind of talk about some stuff that was going on with uh with non-trombone stuff. Yeah, so we've already mentioned that during World War II, um, Earl Williams started working for Boeing. They had production for that. So we know he made other things, um, and then also with the arrows, but in the instrument world, um, there were also some trumpets in production. So there's at least 12 trumpets from what sources are saying. The main source on this would be Rob Stewart, again, because it looks like he has pictures of two of them, one with Williams and Wallace during that partnership, and it's uh, attributed to both of them, and then one that's just um, Earl Williams with Los Angeles uh, listed as the location. Um, but other than that, it looks like there's... There's these two pictures of them, and it's kind of rumored that the tr um, so the person that Rob Stewart acquired this from was saying that they remember receiving it in high school in the 40s in 1941, um, and was told at that time that it was made by someone who made trombones but also made uh, 12 trumpets. So that's the source on that. Is there likely more, probably, especially with those like early years? Um, also, what's interesting with this is uh, speculating why they would go into trumpet making. Um, Rob Stewart kind of is saying that um, this might have been an effort to overcome like uh, depression economics. So during that time, it's kind of like, well, like we can, you know kind of go into different mean uh producing other instruments see where that takes us but um didn't go far um apparently they're also just as good as quality although i will say that not all the while like most of the parts and tubing is sourced from early um earl williams with the trumpets the valves are outsourced to either um it it depends on this one, the Williams and Wallace one, it's saying that it comes from Lyon and Healy in Chicago. And then um, he's kind of speculating on where the other parts might have been sourced with um, Benj being so close and also Earl Williams uh, providing them with tubing. Um, it's kind of suspected that they also provided him with some of those uh, trumpet valves or different parts that he used for a trumpet, but then like the main bell flare is done by him. Yeah, man. Um, so yeah, I think like 
Yeah, I think I think we're primarily looking at uh, him as a trombone guy, but it's kind of interesting the ventures off. Um, but I don't think it's as much as like some other companies that we can look at. Um, Definitely. I will say that I got I kind of feel like I brushed over this. The nine uh, was kind of viewed as the symphony model. Um, so I think that one's kind of in demand as well. I wanted to kind of talk about some people who played uh, the Earl Williams trombones, and I kind of come up, I kind of came to a conclusion going through this. Um, but I think one that's kind of big that jumps to a lot of people's mind is Milt Bernhardt. Um, and I know Ben has some information on that. He might get to here in a second. But uh, he was played with Stan Kenton and Sinatra. And then the trauma of Herb Albert, Bob Edmondson was kind of a big guy. And then there's like a little list of people after that. Jack Teagerton, Kid Ory, uh, J.J. Johnson, which I do know for sure. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Big Nash, Tommy Peterson, and uh, Carl Fontana. Now, I want to say real quick, specifically with a couple of JJ, for example, JJ's famously played on the 3B, you know, and then there's the whole 3B, 2B slide thing, which I I guess is kind of under some debate. I always kind of thought that was a straight fact, but I guess there's some talks on that. I'm sure he did play straight 3Bs, but I kind of think that's beside the point. The point is, is that wasn't a Williams guy. That being said, there are pictures of him playing with an Earl Williams uh, Burbank model, to be exact. Um, and it's the same situation with Carl Fontana. I kind of think of him as a con guy, but um, kind of him and Frank both, honestly. But there's a picture of Carl sitting with Frank, and he's holding a uh, an Earl Williams. Um, same thing with Dick Nash. Like I think he's more frequently known as an Earl guy, but it's not always the horn you see him with. Um, and I would imagine that's the case so for a lot of these guys. On the Dick Nash subject, uh, I have some examples of Dick Nash actually playing on a Bach and William, like a Bach slash Williams. So he had a Bach slide with the Williams Bell, for example. And then like Tigerden, uh, just, just now we were just mentioning him. Tigerden, uh, he actually played on a Williams and Wallace first in the 30s. Then he played on a bunch of other horns and he returned to a modern Williams in the 60s. Yeah, it's so. interesting with Tigerton. I always find Tigerton's uh, horn choices interesting. Um, you know, he played a Reynolds for a long time, and uh, I don't know how well Reynolds is remembered now, but I think they're not super sought out. And uh, I know that uh, when he there was a famous time when Tigerton was holding his Reynolds, and if he, the Reynolds has like an R on the back for the bracing, and um, somebody was asking him like what the R stood for and he said rotten and uh I always kind of find that funny that being said if you have Reynolds I'm not not, <laughs> not trying to come at you. it's funny you mentioned that because this this interview that I was reading that I'm getting some of this information on the people who played uh they actually mentioned they say let's start with Jack Tierden he played any horn someone would pay him to play and always return to Williams <laughs> Fun, uh, fun note about Dick Nash, I've always been a fan. Um, this may mean nothing to a lot of you, but <laughs> I uh, I was really obsessed with Lincoln Center uh, back in undergrad. You can ask Ben. I, um, I, made, I made Ben come with me to go see them once. I actually saw them once outside of that on my own. Um, but the uh, second alto in Lincoln Center is Ted Nash. And I listened to this guy for a long time. And I knew who Ted was for a long time. And I knew who Dick was for a long time. And it wasn't until very, very recently that I found out that Dick Nash is Ted Nash's father. And that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think that's a cool little connection. Um, and then always with the uh, with the uh, Dick Nash thing, I, this might be completely off topic, but go check out the YouTube video of him playing I Cover the Waterfront. I always uh, really, really love that, that video. And uh, I think it's just a fun example of, uh, of his playing. Um, Yeah, looking at some of these people who were uh, playing, uh, I thought it was interesting. I'm sure the uh, I'm sure it's easy to see that the uh, a lot of these guys are from LA. And you talked about yeah, so you talked about Milt Bernhardt, for example. Um, he apparently lived close enough to the shop that he was constantly walking in and out of the store uh, 
or yeah, walking in and out of the shop, actually trying to trying to lead pipes and different parts of his instrument to uh, mix and match and figure out what he wanted. So it really, really lended to that uh, Williams custom feel that you you know hear people talking about. Also found it pretty cool. Just this list. Uh, a lot of these people, um, Tommy Peterson, Milt, Bernhardt, some of these guys, uh, there were some stories about William Tremones being played in a Hoyt's Garage, which was a Tremone choir we talked about in our Patron Saints episode. If you haven't listened to that episode, I highly suggest you do. It is a, I honestly think it's one of our best ones that we've done because it introduced some people to some pretty, uh, pretty important people in the Tremone world. Yeah, guys, if you've not checked out Patron Saints, go do Ben a favor and listen to this, his favorite episode. It makes him sad that you guys don't listen to it. So <laughs> go check it out. Hoyt's Garage is cool. We did find out about that um, when doing that. And uh, definitely going to dig deeper into that. Maybe maybe that'll go somewhere. This kind of wraps up our thoughts on Earl Williams. Um, I was going to go around the room and talk about our personal experience with Earl, and I kind of realized that I'm the only one who's played one. Is that, is, is that right, guys? Like, uh, Jared, have you played an Earl? No. <laughs> <laughs> ben, you haven't played one, right? Uh, All right. Well, I guess you guys can just get my thoughts on the Earl Williams. Once again, uh, we don't do a lot of opinion-based stuff on here. It's The whole point of the podcast is doing research and then Mike. I don't want to get to this, but giving you guys nuggets that you can go learn more and like hopefully you pick something cool up and or get interested by something. So I don't try and do a lot of opinion pieces. But um I will say that I have had the um the pleasure to play a couple of Earl Williams. I played a couple at BAC because uh, Mike Corrigan had a couple and that I've played some at ITF. And resoundingly, I've had the same thought every time I've played one. Um which I think is pretty interesting that. They play really open. They play like concert horns, if that makes any sense. Like if you're a jazz guy, you typically plays pea shooters or whatever. They play like an F attachment symphonic horn in terms of uh, feedback and they're really dark. And that's just my personal thoughts. I mean, <laughs> you highly disagree. That's per perfectly cool. But I've kind of thought that with all of them. And I noticed that was a theme that I saw from a lot of people talking about why they liked them was like, even though they aren't massively different in terms of build, although there's some kind of interesting stuff with like the taper and how quickly it starts getting bigger, um, they are typically darker. Um, and typically they have this like really open sound, which I think is cool. Now, I will say that I don't play that gear personally. Um, but I also personally have a really strong belief that I want a really nice variety of things. And I think that there are people who really want that horn. And I think that if you want that horn, there probably isn't a better horn out there, um, which is a pretty bold statement. I think if if you kind of, I think you should try one. If you've never played one, go try one. And it definitely is different. I think it feels different. Like I think if you played a bunch of horns, you'd be like, oh, this is, this is something. Um, but I do think they're really well-made horns. The slides are apparently historically really good. Uh, across the board, we found a lot of people who are really into the slides. I'm not as obsessed with slides as Ben. We've talked about that before. I'm like a bell guy, but their bells have a lot have a life of their own too. Um, so definitely, I don't know, definitely check one out if you ever get the chance. Um, and like we said, that's actually not the easiest thing to do just with the amount that were made and everything. Um, so with that kind of wrapping stuff up, I'm just gonna, once again, if you've made it to the end of this episode, thank you so much for listening. We do have the Patreon, go check it out. It starts off at three bucks a month. Um, it's not a lot, but it really goes a long way towards helping us uh, keep this going, doing, hosting all this and everything costs me a little bit of money. So I'm trying to break even, basically. Um, and on top of that, I think it's a really cool community, what we're building with the Patreon stuff. Um, but our album recommendation for this week is uh, Cyclic Journey by Marshall Jilks. Uh, this was like his most recent release. I, uh, I really enjoyed this album. Whenever I did Conrad on the last <laughs> recommendation, I was thinking about doing this recommendation. And so I'm coming back around to it. It's got 
partial on trombone and he composes and I'm parts on piano. Linda uh, Mayhan on bass, Jonathan Blake's on drums. Sorry, Jonathan Blake on drums. He's one of my favorite uh, drummers, by the way. Uh, Brandon Rinhart on trumpet, Ethan Bindensworth on trumpet, Tommy uh, Kandelik on trumpet, Adam Unsworth on horn, uh, Joseph Alessi on trombone. You guys might know who he is. Um, Demandre Thurman on euphonium, Nick Schwartz on the bass trombone, and Marcus Rojas on tuba. Um, and that's what that's what it is. It's like Marshall with like a trio kind of thing with Aaron Parks and um, Jonathan Blake. And then he's got a bunch of like little horn ensemble stuff with uh, Joe Alessi. It just sounds really fantastic. Marshall is, uh, he's like top of the game. I mean, it is what it is. He's like one of the best out there. He's setting the bar in a lot of ways. I mean, like not saying that there's not guys at that level, but he's definitely in the top tier. Um, and uh, I've always been a huge fan. So once again, I want to thank you guys for listening. And as always, happy shedding and uh, see you next time.